Hey y'all, welcome to the Flow State, our new H2O Dreams podcast, live podcast, live broadcast, streamcast, whatever you want to call it. Um, we really like this format, so we're going to continue to use this format and kind of use it as a you know stream of consciousness kind of instructional content, um, ideas that you know, the viewers kind of give us to, to follow up on, you know, last week we talked about uh, rescue PFDs, you know, and earlier this, uh, this year we talked about, um, you know, specifically leadership tactics on the river. Um, today's podcast is going to be a little bit different and we're going to shoot a little bit more from the hip, so, you know, feel free to leave comments below um, and ask questions or give some feedback. We're both... Uh, following along here and going to moderate as we kind of go along. Um, so without further ado, we're going to talk about a little bit about motivation. Uh, and you know, it says here understanding motivation in extreme sports, and this could be applied to a lot of different extreme sports. And I think this, you know, understanding motivation actually is something that could be, um, you know, understanding it in this particular uh, discipline could be applied to other disciplines in life as well. Um, and generally when you hear folks say, you know, that they've learned so much from, you know, a particular outdoor sport or an adventure sport and that, you know, it has those real, real life applications, I think this is what they're specifically talking about. Um, because you're, you're overcoming a lot of, um, a lot of really hard things in these sports. These are, these are not easy sports. They require a lot of grit, um, a lot of tenacity, um, and a lot of motivation for that matter. So, specifically about motivation, what I would like to talk about, and if you've never had a discussion of understanding motivation, primarily motivation can be broken down into two, two different kinds of motivation. That's that intrinsic motivation and that extrinsic motivation. So, in simpler terms, you know, motivation that comes from me versus motivation that is being affected by others. Um, so... By and large, I, I would have to say, and you probably agree with this, that most people, when they come into this sport, they're individually motivated. You know, they, they, <laughs> see, this is where, this is where we're going to have, have some, we're going to have a variety show. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have some subjectivity to I, this. I actually disagree. I feel like most of the people I work with, they're, you know, their buddy paddles, their girlfriend paddles, their husband paddles, whatever, so it's. They, there's an external motivator, the extrinsic motivation. Sure. And it's like, I'm tired of getting left behind, or my friend does this, and it's awesome, and I want to do it too. So you have a different, I think maybe we work with two different types of students. Possibly. A lot of the time. I work with a lot of beginners. Sure. So I want to get started in this so that I can be a part of this. I think you're forgetting about 15 years of me teaching beginners before. The yeah, but I'm, st I'm <laughs> referencing <laughs> recent history. Um. So, I mean, I think uh, the obvious point here is that, you know, folks can come in with both sure. as well. Um, and, Way uh, to get us back on track. Yeah, <laughs> just reeling this back <laughs> in here. Um, primarily, what, what my point is going to be this evening is how important uh, intrinsic motivation is for long-term health of growth within, in, um, you know, personal, personal growth in paddle sports. Um, Especially when folks are kind of hitting the, the rough and tumble of it. Yeah. If um, you know they they aren't digging deep and they're not actually finding those those motivators, um, they're they're going to have a tough time continuing on. Um, and actually, we we wrote a great article about this. Uh, well, I wrote a great article about this. I think. Uh, yeah, you didn't have you any did. input from me at all. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna post the link below, um, but. It's, it's an article specifically talking about, you know, making a case for um, intrinsic or personal motivation as opposed to outside motivators. Um, the, again, the reason why I, I think I'm bringing this up more so is, by and large, what we see as paddle sports instructors, the majority of the folks are, what Lydia said, probably more extrinsically motivated. Um, even if they may have gotten started initially you know, looking at a sport, I know for me personally, I remember looking at people with roof racks and things on top of their car, I was like, that's cool, I want to do that, that's what I want to be, that's what I want to look like, that's an intrinsic motivator. Um, but ultimately what ended up happening as soon as I'm kind of working my way 
through that learning curve, now I'm getting all of this noise from you know external sources, and it's it's not without the best intentions from those folks. And you know the, the beauty of this sport, I think, is again because you do get folks that stick with it long term. They've been through all of these, you know, these these hardships and everything else. I I'm doing a really good job selling the sport right now, but it's tough. <laughs> you know, it's hard. Um, you know, they feel so passionate about how they learned because they're at this point now. They want to share. They want people to have the best experience. But it's so important to understand that how and how a person grows through just about anything has to come down to how they grow, not how other people grow. So, you know, this is the toughest job that we face daily as educators is not projecting outward onto a student, but instead asking the right questions to get, you know, that inward out. Can I ask you a question to sure. kind of direct here? Um, we're talking about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. So mm -hmm. I think inside, outside. So I want to do this because of something that's coming from within versus I want to do this because that roof rack looks dope and I want to roof rack on my car. <laughs> um, is there anything wrong with extrinsic motivation? You can you can wait to answer that later on if, if you're going to get there somewhere else down the road. But I don't... This is very shoot from the hip. Lady, yeah. You know? So I don't want to... I think maybe we should talk about pros and cons of inside versus outside motivations because I think it's easy to maybe get down on one and elevate another mm -hmm. or maybe that's correct I don't know yeah so do we want to go kind of list some pros and some cons yeah why not so I mean I think one of the the pros of intrinsic motivation would be that it is personal so therefore you know because it's coming from that person you know they're they're going to be much more married to that idea. Okay. So in that sense, there's a commitment, right? There's ownership. There's ownership. Yeah. There's a commitment and even a willingness. Well, because what's an example of intrinsic motivation? Seeing somebody drive by with that roof rack. And I, don't, like, I think that's external. So, so to me, internal is I want to be better. I want to be healthier. I need to burn off some stress. So a sense of self, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically me looking at the roof rack is my sense of self too. It's an image that I want to portray, but it's coming from... You're not going to sell me on that one. Okay. I think that's external. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the rewards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the big thing though with the extrinsic is that it, it, it is other folks. Yeah. You know, other beings, other people that are essentially awarding you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's very encouraging. There's a pro right there. Yeah. You know, and you get, you get the power in numbers. Um, you know, it's the it's the stoke. It's like um, you know, coming off of Sockum Dog on the Chituga with 20, <laughs> 20 or so people watching. Yeah. And, and you boof the shit out of it, and and how did you feel after that? Awesome. You wanted that feeling <laughs> yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, that absolutely was wanted that feeling yeah. again. But you know, it took it took your your grit, your your guts. Yeah, that to, moment is fleeting. You know, yeah. to like constantly chase that. I think maybe that's the important part is that. Having an extrinsic extrinsic motivation isn't bad, but that we really need we need the that fabric woven with internal motivations. I yeah. think is, is the important point point to make. Yeah. So in that instant where you know maybe you had a line previous, and somebody was encouraging you to go back up, but it, something tells me that wasn't what got you to go back up. I've, no, I was gonna do it anyway. Yeah, and I've <laughs> I've been there where somebody yeah. outwardly is like go back up and do it again. And, you know, it's like, no. When somebody, by somebody you mean. Listen, you, you keep wanting to, you keep wanting to use names yep. and there's no need to use names. Okay. I'm keeping the anonymity okay. in this. Um, so it. we can just be using any old story okay. here. So. Let's get back on track. Yeah. That. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so we're talking about pros and pros cons. Pros and cons. So yeah. pros, again, it's something personal. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a personal motivation in that it's an image that they have conjured up in their own mm -hmm. mind. Like I said, like when I, <laughs> Adam Butler's like, yeah, that roof rack. But when <laughs> I saw that, like that had an impact on me when I was younger. Like I remember going to the outfitter and I'm from Ohio, so there weren't many outfitters, but wh which ones there were, they were good. And mm -hmm. like there was a, an image that kind of came along with it. And that was the image that I wanted to be. Yeah. Now, granted, you can argue that some of that was marketing and all this other stuff, but it was it was me internally saying that is the kind of person mm -hmm. I wanted to be. Okay. 
So, and here I am, 20, you know, well, almost 30 years later after probably the initial... And you have not one, but two roof racks. I, I have two roof racks, you're correct. Um, You've arrived. But that's what's carried me through, <laughs> right? So yeah. I, I can think back to, you know, one critical moment in time that really set the course. And there were m multiple things that happened along that timeline that helped reinforce that. But yeah. it was that initial motivator that really got me going on it. Yeah. I remember I reading Rock and Ice magazine and there wasn't a surface on our so house growing up. That would be an extrinsic motivator. I was though, extrinsically would... extrinsically motivated to start kayaking because you were going off kayaking with my parents without me. Anonymity. <laughs> you were going off some person that I know was going off and paddling with other people that I know without me and I was tired of being left behind. Sure. I wanted to. I I wanted to at least try and see if it was something that I could do, mm -hmm. because I wanted to be a part of that community. Mm -hmm. So, what would be the pro of that? Community. Community. Yeah. So I think when community is positive, certainly com community can be toxic too. Peer pressure can be positive, but peer pressure can be toxic. So we have both a pro and a yeah. con with with that extrinsic yeah. motivator in terms of community. Um, and you know, I, that's just interpersonal skills, like more than anything else. This is talking about how we talk and cope with other people. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think how that interplays with groups, I think, is such an important part of you know life as a whole. Yeah. And you know, it, I'd say by and large, whitewater kayakers are pretty terrible at it. Like we're we're I would say that terrible like, at what communicating amongst a group especially in uncomfortable situations ah, I think it depends on the group yeah it can't well sure but if I would have to just throw everybody under the bus here you know if I would have to paint a broad brush stroke of generalization which I you know I, I don't like doing but but I'd you say, are I, and we could probably <laughs> argue that communication as a whole you know in the world right now is, is a really uh, tough yeah, one but we're going yeah. down a rabbit hole there mm -hmm. um, <laughs> My wife always keeps me in check yep. here. So, um, but that being said, that interpersonal play yeah. is such an important part. And when that starts to break down, you know, when that starts to break down, you really have to gut check yourself. So, one of the things that I don't and I don't say this right away, but when I work with beginner paddlers. You made mention, you know, earlier you kind of made a joke like, yeah, like kayaking's hard. Like it's important for us to know why we're doing this. And I say that to talk about that with beginner students a lot, especially when they get to a point where they're asking like what their next step is. You know, what do I do next? Do I learn to roll? Um, you know, do I go out paddling? And um, I like talking about the challenges in paddling, that it can mm -hmm. be scary and it can be hard and it can be frustrating. Um, but that we can get through those challenges if we know why we, why we want to. Yeah. Um, and especially, I think, I think enjoyment and having fun is, is paramount to that. I, I would argue that it's, it's so important to do that early on in a paddling career. To, to let people know that well, they, it's hard? That they, well, not just that, but to define what it is that they're trying to get out of this. Yeah. Um, you know, if they don't, you can, it, it muddies up real quick. It really does. Yeah. A lot of the time working with more advanced students, a lot of the discussion that I'll have is kind of redefining that. Well, you know, people are like, well, I'm just not feeling it anymore. Yeah. Well, what happened? Um, you know, what caused that shift? Um, but why, why did you originally get involved with it? And I mean, I think everybody will say fun is number one. Yeah. Um, we, we all know that fun can't, happen at the expense of safety or anything right. like that um, so those two kind of have to to go hand in hand um, but aside from that you know the the other factors in that keep us moving forward is so individual then um, but you know or, or it's not individual so it's our um, friends saying come out come with us we miss you yeah I you got that yeah you've got the marketing machine of paddle sports yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna so go glass, glass half empty there i'm glass half full so i'm definitely <laughs> gonna say you know the marketing aspect like 
that's what drives a lot of people to 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 continue to push sometimes yeah into scary places when maybe personally that's not where they they really want to be um you know it, i think everybody really has to do a gut check that's yeah that's, i think that's really what does what that look down. like what's that conversation with yourself like <laughs> not a... not the gut check but like why am i doing this why am i doing this yeah. like have you ever had a, a moment like that in yeah paddling? with well in paddling yeah yeah, I think I have. Like, I just had it the other day. You know, I just, um, I'm trying to think to myself right now, like, what is it? Like, I'm thinking about green race right now. It's that time of the year. And green race is scary. Um, but it's super fun. You get so much stoke, and the community is so great around that around that event. Yeah. And, um, you know, the organizers do a phenomenal job. Um, but, you know, there's, you're by yourself. Let me tell you, like, so that internal motivation has to be really well defined. Yeah. So you even when you're training and everything, you're with other people, but you're by yourself during that, you know, five minutes or whatever. Um, and uh, you know, the thing about it is, with that, uh, you really have to think hard to yourself. Like, what is it? Yeah. That I'm trying to, to get out of this. Mm-hmm. Um, what does it usually boil down to? Do you think? If you had to paint with a broad brushstroke. Some of it's per- personal accomplishment. Um, like, for me, I'm now setting goals. Yeah. What like, do you think, like, what do you think most people that are, you know, since we're talking about Green Race, what's the, what's the motivation? Is it all glory? That's a tough one. <laughs> you know, it's ego, right? Yeah. So ego is sense of self. Like, I think, you know, the word ego gets used often in a, in a really negative light. You know, ego is sense of self, like... As we as we grow as adults, we we this sense of self develops and everything else. So and we're trying to find our place in the world. Um, but you know, you hear a lot of people also say, "I'm trying to beat myself." Yeah. I, I think that that's internal. That's intrinsic. That's, yeah. That's, that's self improvement. And that's that's where I'm at with it. Yeah. Maybe my first green race, I was motivated by the fact that friends were doing it. Um, I wanted to see what it was all about. Yeah. Um, but now it's like, you know, what what am I trying to accomplish out of it? Yeah. And. Uh, you know, last year was super stressful. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like three months of stress leading up to the event. And um, that's a lot of weight to carry. And so right now, like, where I'm at is I'm kind of bargaining with myself in the sense of, do I want to carry that weight for the next three months? Or yeah. do I want to go do something else? What's wrong with just doing something fun? Um, <laughs> what's wrong with just fun? Yeah, what's wrong with just fun? <laughs> um, I like that. And, uh, you know, it's not that the green race isn't fun, but there's two different kinds of fun, right? You have type A fun which yeah. is the fun in the moment, and then there's type B fun, which is like, man, this sucks. <laughs> I've always heard there's... But so we've you look back before. on it, and it's like, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, then there's that third type of fun. Which, which is, is not fun. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it wasn't fun during, and it wasn't really fun in retrospect, but there's still something there. There's that like little sliver of gratification. Well, and there's so many little moments in there yeah. that are fun. Yeah. But like, And I always tell this to students that I work with, you know that feeling you get below the rapid? It doesn't come without the feeling right, above the rapid. Right. So you can't just take one or the other. And right. that's the that's the thing that we constantly well, are battling with this sport. And it's kind of like the big scary thing that we want to do in life, right? So personally, when we started a business, you know, it was taking a leap of faith. We're jumping off a cliff, essentially. Yeah. And, you know, you, you had to ask yourself, like, Man, we didn't even know what the reward would be. Yeah. We don't. We still. I don't even know if we still do. <laughs> I know what the like, reward is. It's the reward being my is being own boss. being our own boss, yeah. but more so, like it's like being able to execute a vision in education. Sure. Like I think for me, that's my that's sure. my motivator. But um, you know, like the reward is typically seeing the satisfaction sure. on somebody else's so, face. So there's something that I want to go back to, which is you mentioned the. I really like this. You can't have the feeling at the bottom of the rapid without having the feeling at the top. Um, and I, you know, as a runner, I think I, <laughs> that's one of the battles that I go through too, which is the feeling that I have before the run and a lot of times during the run has to come in order for me to get that feeling at the end of the run too. Mm-hmm. You know, that high, the whether it's endorphins or adrenaline or whatever. And of course, you know, I experience that with kayaking too. One of the things that I read while just kind of getting, trying to get, my mind uh, set for talking about this stuff is that, you know, we, we try to really characterize our emotions and maybe even our motivations into 
one dimensional one dimensional compartments which sure. is this is good this is bad so i'm having fun that's good i'm scared that's bad um i get to hang out with all my friends that's good or you know i'm paddling with a bunch of new people that's bad um and i i maybe it's worthwhile for us to um not compartmentalize in terms of positive or negative but in terms of what comes from within and what what is coming from outside. Um, so one of the things that I read, um, again, while preparing for this evening, um, was looking at like elite athletes, people that are constantly performing um, at a really high level, and that their ex intrinsic motivations, their motivations from inside, have to be really, really strong because they're going to experience dips in performance. They're going to experience injury. Um, you know, these are people that might have sponsors, they might lose sponsors, they might lose races, which means they don't get paid. So having that internal motivation, which is, I love this, I love the process, I love the suffering, I love the companionship, the camaraderie, whatever, having a really um, strong understanding of that as something that might not always be good, bad, but it's fuel, mm -hmm. right? And you said, I, I love the suffering, and actually that's, you know, when we lead trips and do things with larger groups, it's a lot of group dynamic. Yeah. I love the the silent suffering yeah. that goes yeah. on. Like, you know, it's I actually really do. Like, you know, to me it's um it's a chess game with myself, you know, with patience, yeah. with you know, foresight with all of these different things. But yeah, it's like it's it's that stuff that yeah. I really thrive on, like in the moment when everything extrinsically is like <gasps> don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, <laughs> it's don't just do like, this. Yeah, it's just like everything is like we had we received that one compliment the one yeah. time that we make good ducks. <laughs> you know, we're calm on the surface but kicking like hell underneath the yeah. water. And I like that kicking like hell underneath the yeah. water part. So like the that's chaos. The chaos. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Like, I, I was love just managing talking to someone it. the other day and we were um we were on our way to kayaking and we were hiking to where we were going and um, we were talking about like mountain biking and trail running and stuff and they were like, man, I just can't get into running and I just, I hate it. It's not fun. And I was like, yeah, I don't think it's very much fun either. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't really like it either. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly not in the moment. Right? Um, there's like so many, you know, like benefits as a result that I really enjoy. So, so that, that process of like, mm. let's bring up running real quick okay. because you know, you, you used running a lot last year. Yeah. And you talked about how you used it in different in different ways. The things that you thought about and everything. And I've I grew up competitive running, and I I stink and hate running now. Like, and I had something weird happen this year. Um, I had to run a shuttle over at the French Broad, which is like you know what is that? Like almost five miles on the railroad tracks. It's a crappy shuttle. Like if you think about it, you're four point two. Okay, so four miles on yeah. railroad tracks, which is yeah. tough. It's hot. Yeah. But, you know, the thing was, is, is I kind of really set the tone early. I was like, all right, this is what you're going to try to think about. Uh-oh, Eric Mountain doesn't like our video. Yeah, well, he just angry faced This us. is what you're going to try to try to think about. And I kind of like, it was kind of in a way, it was like a mantra. Um, and suddenly it was like, I even got into what was visually happening and how it was kind of repetitive in a way. It was, but I, then I focused on the breath. And, you know, a lot of people will bring up meditation. Mm -hmm. um, it's extremely meditative, and I found my meditation with it again. Yeah. And the thing that was happening last year with, um, you know, the kayaking for me was depending on who I was paddling with, what day it was, how I was feeling, it was that. It was meditation sure. for me. So it was like being able to quell out all of the other noises yeah. in my life. And, you know, you hear people say this all the time. I, I go kayaking to escape my other life yeah. and feel like I'm by my... Yeah, I mean... But it goes so much deeper, like you have so much distraction and noise in your life that it's activities like this, especially if you can really tap into it, that really kind of just puts it all there. Narrowed focus. Yeah. They I would say, say that it's being in the moment or whatever. With paddling, you know, especially with whitewater, you can't escape. You are fully connected. Um, yeah. And I think about that, you know, again, we're making the kayaking, running parallels back and forth, but... Um, I would say I run to escape because it's something that you really just can kind of turn your brain off and yeah. just motor. Um, but kayaking is that ultra focus. Yeah. You have to connect to the environment. You have to connect to the moment. You have to connect with yourself, first and foremost, people around you. 
Um, so back to motivation though. Yeah. What is that? Is that even motivation? Are we t- are we even talking about motivation anymore? Like maybe that is the motivation. That's, it's necessitated by your environment, I think. Yeah. So it's that you can be argued. And you maybe can argue that's, that's the, an extrinsic motivator. But maybe that is that's what boils down to success. Yeah. Which so you, is you were saying basically that your environment dictates certain motivations to you. Like you have to be motivated to try these particular things to be successful in kayaking. Um, would you would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe you know, perhaps it's relative, but wouldn't you say you know when you're you're talking about for training for a green race, like your motivation has to be dialed in. The river's demanding that you're focused, mm-hmm. right? I just found that out <laughs> the other day when I dropped some focus. Yeah. Um, so maybe the environment specifically can dictate motivation. Yeah. Um, those, you know, those and, or and requirements. Right. So, but also, all right. So I'm thinking about maybe paddlers that are people that are purely motivated by extrinsic forces. They're purely motivated for the Instagram photo or, you know, hanging out with their buddies. And I, I, I bring up this example being having completely been that person on multiple occasions and I'm sure you've been there too. Look at my dinner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean check out my forty five degree stern squirt. <laughs> who doesn't yeah, who doesn't love a good photo, right? Yeah, like yeah, but proof. I'm saying but like maybe that, you know, are we saying that perhaps intrinsic motivations are stronger and as a result more um, more there's more fortitude to the demands of the river. You know, when we get to class four or five, if all I'm thinking about is getting that sick photo, you know. You're dropping focus. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, I, I think I've talked about this. I haven't worn a GoPro. I did last year for training. It was yeah, a little bit different. Yeah, you wore a GoPro. Um, <laughs> I always crash when I wear a GoPro. Well, that's my point, <laughs> right? So, like, you're trying, you're too busy capturing, you getting that footy, bro. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result, it drops focus Yeah. and I've actually, I've gained a lot more enjoyment just in the past year and a half. Like I said, two years, I haven't worn the GoPro for like personal reasons other than like training. Yeah. That's it. That's the only reason why I wear it. So it's like video study. Um, and I that's feel, an, that's I feel an intrinsic motivator because you're trying to improve that. Self-improvement. Yeah. I li- How can I learn from, but I feel so much better. Yeah. I feel lighter. I feel like. I don't have to perform to a particular expectation yeah. to post that video, right? Right, and in a way, like you can you can argue that when you paddle with a group, sometimes that they are the GoPro video. You're feeling like you have to perform to a particular level okay. for that particular group, yeah. And that like that pressures that puts you know undue pressure onto an individual yeah. we hear it all the time i don't want to hold my group back yeah you know with beginners you know when they they experience swims yeah so you extrinsic know extrinsic motivator yeah yeah my, your motivation is the approval of the people around you yes and i think that's going back to that article i posted um you know that's my case for individual motivation mm-hmm. through the initial phase of the learning curve it's so important that us as educators, like any educator out there, whether it's at um, you know the professional level, the club level, the rec- you know just pure, like taking a buddy out level, yeah. any of that, you have to like. I, I feel you really have to breed something inside of that person, so that they are individually motivated, that they're going to drive through, despite you know you going. It happens to everybody, despite you saying this is the next thing we're going to do. Uh, just you know, they they are the ones now seeking instead of you telling and projecting. Yeah. They get ownership. Yeah. And with that ownership, you start to see this growth of willingness to try new things. Yeah. And where real learning happens is when you have a party that's willing to listen, to willing you know, willing to try. Yeah. As soon as that willingness leaves, as soon as it leaves, learning stops. It stops dead right there. So I want to talk about something else that I discovered, which I'm sure is familiar to some folks that are watching right now, which is um, a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset, because you're talking about particularly in the beginner progression, but I think we all get to that point where we're trying to 
we're trying to learn something. We're trying to get better at boofing. I'm trying to get better at stone sports right now. So I crash all the time. I flip over all the time. Sometimes I carpal roll. Sometimes I'm just crashing into reps, whatever. Um, I'm work working with students right now that are, you know, working on confidence with combat rolling. Um, and a fixed mindset believes that we have a capacity. Um, intelligence, physical abilities. The vessel stays the same exactly. size. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Growth mindset is that with effort and practice and study, um, the vessel I can, grows. I can or I can change and it. And what we fill it I with. I can change it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you're talking about, you know, wearing your GoPro for training. Um, and I know, you know, last year watching you, like if you crashed or if you had a bobble coming through some part, you're sitting there and you're watching it, the sequence over and over and over again. So you can figure out what it is that you did so you can know how to do it differently next time. Yeah. So that's the difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, which is the growth mindset looks at failure or unintended outcome as an opportunity to learn. The, gr the fixed mindset sees that as, this is my top end. Yeah. This is what I'm capable of. I failed because I'm not actually capable of yeah. surpassing We hear it that. all the time, I'll yeah. never do that. I'll never well, be capable of that. Well, and what, I had a really interesting conversation with someone the other day about this, talking about ways to practice and improve, which is this person hanging out with the people that they paddle with and saying, hey, I'm really trying to work on this right now. And that means that I might swim or I might crash. Um, can you just keep eyes on me and like look out for A, B, and C? Because I'm going to be working on this like in the next couple weeks or the yeah. next time we paddle together. And how that is a, a big shift from just, you know, oh my God, I flipped over. Like, am I going to roll? Am I going to swim? What is my group thing? And like bringing that group into the conversation, which is I'm trying to grow, I'm trying to improve. And that means I'm going to crash a little bit. And crashing is relative. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a cool. I thought that was a cool, Yeah. that's, you know, you're, you're looking at that so, as either this is me at my top end or, hey, this is an opportunity for me to learn and reassess. So would we say, we didn't list pros and cons like we said we would or anything else, but would we say that we've made a case for intrinsic motivation? I think so. Like extrinsic is a great way of getting I don't think that, I'll say that I don't think extrinsic motivation is bad no or, or no, no, is no. always bad yeah but if it's the sole motivator right. it's you know it's not going to get you through right so okay let's ask the question if you're mentoring or you're teaching somebody how is it that you can grow this while still when you know generally speaking what's going to be best for a person for growth yeah how can you do it where you know their expectations their motivations their willingness might not be big enough yet to grasp or endure for the next step I don't totally step in understand learning. your question. So, How do you get someone to be like, yeah, I'm going to crash while I'm figuring this out? Yeah. Um, or how do you get them to try practicing in a particular way that you know is going to create long-term success versus short-term so success? So I don't know. I don't know. I'm still figuring this out. And, you know, anybody that I've worked with in the past, if I did something right, let me know. Because <laughs> I feel like I'm still going through trial and error with that. Um, One disadvantage that, to being an instructor is we don't necessarily hear feedback from students all the time. Yeah. Like we get the thumbs up and things like that or the thumbs down even and we don't get like... But as far like, as like language and feedback that yeah. I give to my student, yeah. like whatever sticks, I yeah. don't know, um, always. But um, something that helped me in my learning progression, you and, you know, we'll keep things anonymous, but you and another person very early on when I was, you know, maybe at a point where a lot of people start feeling like they shouldn't flip over anymore. Um, they're paddling class two, three, and their, you know, their role is pretty good, but like now they want to be upright all the time. And I would go paddling with you and um, unnamed suspect, and you guys would just crash everywhere. Like, <laughs> like you were like always splatting stuff and doing stern squares. And giggling. And and giggling, and like I'm watching two people that I know to be very talented, very competent boaters, look like absolute clowns on the water. Well, you guys was... showed me that it was okay to play. Yeah. And and for me that was, you know, and I'm, you know, been going out and paddling with some folks lately the last couple of weeks which has been awesome and we're all just out there like trying to do stuff and none of us are like really very good at any of it, but we're trying. Yeah. Um I think uh you know, surrounding yourself with people that are humble to the point where they're willing to put themselves out there to try and say, hey, I'm trying to learn, or this is something I'd really like to be able to do, 
and it's going to look really funny in, in the meantime. Yeah. Um, and also finding people that are like-minded in that pursuit. They yeah. want to be there with you. They want to grow too. Yeah. I had a great mentor, John Clark, over at the NOC. Um, him and I were co-teaching a class one day, and I was still that clown that you yeah. described because <laughs> I was just trying to learn everything. I remember seeing all the cool moves and everything. I went for a rock spin. And I think I flipped over in about two inches of water and, you know, lost a bunch of skin off my hands and rolled up. And, uh, you know, John said something along the lines of, Chris, you are a never-ending source of entertainment. <laughs> and I took it at first as like, are you calling me a bad paddler? And he goes, no, no. He's like, it's your, you know, it, it, it's that idea of that I willingness to try. I love paddling with people like that. Yeah. I can off the top of my head think of a handful of people like, it's so fun to be on the water with them because they're going to try anything. Yeah. And the more I watch them try, the more it makes me want to try. Because yeah. I know that the worst thing that's going to happen is I'm going to do the same dorky thing that my friend just did. Yeah. And then we're going to laugh about it. It's a, it's, um, in a lot of the time, it's in, in areas that really, you know, are inconsequential. Inconsequential. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and we we do it as training wheels for the areas of yeah. consequence. Yeah, absolutely. So, but, absolutely. You know, and the thing is, is when I get to that gut check above a big scary rapid, what I'm weighing and measuring is how often I've been doing that silly stuff. <laughs> it's really, it's because it's my training wheels for the adversity yeah. in paddle sports. Um, so when I sit above that rapid, you know, I, again, some people will say it's faith over fear or you know, your growth happens when you put your desires over your fears, but there's a measurement that happens that's logical. Yeah. Like this is, this is judgment. You start thinking to yourself, you know, what are the moves? Can I make the moves? What are the consequences if I don't make yeah. the moves? This is credit to Tom McCune, by the way. Um, and I, I even like to add in like, you know, what's, how capable of, am I like of recovery? Yeah, that's, I think that's the that's the important that's the missing piece a lot of the time, which is I'm gonna try this hard thing or this new thing, um, and not necessarily assessing the recovery yeah. recovery of body and mind. Yeah. I think I th that part's important. I think that you know, this is a sport, um, just like a lot of other extreme sports. If we want to use the term extreme sports, um, it's an adventure sport or whatever. Um, and you know, there's some people that live this as a life. Like this is. They're just constantly in pursuit of pushing their their personal limits. You, I, I, I'm not trying to sound cliche. Like there are people that live in that element yeah. constantly, and we look at these people as role models. But they live in that element constantly. And if you look at the consequence of what they're doing at that top end, that's a consequence that many of us at a recreational level are so unwilling to accept. Yet we want that reward. We want that that pinnacle. Uh, success that they're achieving and I'd say that's the one dangerous part about sports marketing um, is that you know it, it really has like it's the carrot on the end of the stick hey check this new equipment out you can yeah. do it like so and so it's like no you can't and, and, I, <laughs> I'm, and it, this is no dig to anybody in particular unless you're living it like it, unless that is your discipline in life like you're not going to do it to that same level there's there might be the anomaly of people who can come off yeah. the couch every now so and again. So I let's let's go back to our you know keep jumping into the running conversation. I saw this article pop up not that long ago, um, and it had some like. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna lump myself into that. I can't do it either. <laughs> I can't. Um, I it had some sort of like clickbait title, and it was like how to run a hundred miles without training. And it's this guy, and he essentially, like, comes off the couch, and he's running, like, three times a week for I don't know how long. And he goes and he does this, like, really prolific 100-mile race. And um, I was cool because the running community kind of called him on it. He was, like, I don't know. He had been, like, a Navy SEAL or, you know, had some kind of, like, really foundational background that allowed him to tap into – complimentary training yeah. so that he didn't necessarily and we work with folks like that all the time that have like an incredible background in something else that equips them for success yeah. in whitewater mentally or physically or both um but that you know you i like what you say sometimes you're like there's no substitute for seat time um it's true there's no substitute for miles yeah you know it's true it really is you know and 
you know, you asked me earlier this year, what do you tell a person that just can't give it the time, that wants to paddle at your level? You gotta Those give two it, things don't. You gotta, you gotta give exist. it the time. Yeah. You have to. Give or it the you time. have to. Or you have to accelerate it in a way that's not. Like, or you have to rename your goals. Yeah. You have to get realistic. It's honesty. I remember um, talking with someone one time that was in a, a point of frustration that I can relate to, and I'm sure a lot of folks can relate to, which was they were really frustrated at the level that they were paddling, um, but they were really scared also mm -hmm. about you know working their way up to. So they're bored in their current environment, but they fear the environment that's like just around the corner. Um, and I remember talking to this person and being like, well, you either got to get okay with where you're at and learn to enjoy where you're at, or you have to have the hot, hard conversation, which is how can you go around the corner and get into that next environment? Mm -hmm. um, and actually a funny conversation that inspired me to take an introspective look into myself too and be like, I'm in a similar position where I'm frustrated with my current environment and I'm scared about what's around the corner and I have to be realistic about am I going to learn to be okay with where I am or do I need to have a hard conversation with myself about the work that's required to take the next steps. Yeah. And there's sacrifice that's involved. Yeah. So um, we're talking about goal setting now. Yeah. I think goal setting is, is, is taking your motivations and making them reality. Is really what it is so you're you know a motivator well n motivation doesn't necessarily have to be that right but a motivator typically will point you to what your goal is can you have motivation without a goal what are you motivated for then maybe they just like to be on the water they just so your goal your goal is to be out on the water then yeah so it's still it's still a goal yeah like I, I don't think that you know motivators um, that's a great question. That's a really good question. Do those, are those things mutually exclusive? Yeah. All right. So our 15 viewers, we're talking to you guys. Can you have motivation without a goal? We want to hear. Yeah. Um, I would say no. That would be my argument. That's it. Just no. <laughs> no, I, but I, I would say that no, you'd have I, to have. I think you can. I think, you know, the, the goal isn't your, it might not be your, like, I want to run the big three on the green or like I want to throw a loop or whatever. Um, but that person, you know, their motivation is, is for pure like baseline access, yeah. whatever that is to them. Yeah. So we got a couple different answers here. So David Bazemore said, yes, you can, you can, you can have, uh, we need more info. Yeah. You David. can't just, you can't, can't just say, just say this yes is not a yes or no and, question. Um, <laughs> come on. I mean, Give us more. you're not in front of the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Taylor, you posted up about how, um, you know, where you were at um, personally and emotionally and how whitewater kayaking probably gave you, and Lee, same thing, you can't just give two, yeah. two word answers, <laughs> um, how whitewater kayaking gave you uh, a focus. My guess is it was a focus more than anything else. Um, and, I, you know, I've worked with folks with PTSD before. Um, both from a military background and even, believe it or not, from a, a kayaking background, somebody having a traumatic experience and having stress sure. triggers and everything else. Um, but the big thing is is being able to, to get hyper-focused and kind of being able to uh, clear the gray in the mind. Um, I would argue that when I first started kayaking, uh, you know, when I was 20, I didn't really have a whole lot of direction in my life and it gave me a lot of focus. It was something that I was, um, you know... Lack of direction gives you focus. Lack of direction, it gave me focus when I had a lack of direction. So, lack of distraction. Lack of distraction. Yeah, it was a way to... And I'm still the same way. I, you know, I'm sure um, I would be diagnosed ADD or something like that. I'm kind of all over the place. Like, that's why I love doing so many different things, I think. I think. Like, if, <laughs> clinically, I'm sure somebody would say that um, you know, the way right. I, you want to pull me back in, but <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to pull it back in. No, absolutely not. I'm like, I'm all over the place like where I am right now. <laughs> you quit distracting me and, you know, maybe I would be, get on, t on to topic here. But anyhow, you know, it was, it was, a uh, it was a period of my life where I didn't have a lot of focus and suddenly I had something that I could absolutely focus in on that I was motivated by. Yeah. So I like this one. So the, the sport itself motivated. Yeah. Me. So, okay. 
So Amanda says that she's motivated to get through every day but doesn't necessarily have a goal each day. So the motivation is just the whatever cards are dealt, right? Mm -hmm. It's the pure experience. Yeah. Wait a minute. Who? who what? Amanda. You don't have her comment. Yeah, I don't we're having, know. Her. We're having various comments here. <laughs> yeah, I can't see any of those. Yeah. Um, Lee Martin said, aimless direction indicates a lack of a goal. I think so. And I had a very clear goal when I started school, when I started college, and then I changed that. Yeah. And then I didn't know what it was that I was motivated by anymore. And then kayaking entered my life. And it was just like, boom, like suddenly focus. Um, but it didn't, like it had to be something that I wanted to do back to you know the yeah. intrinsic motivator yeah. like it had to come from me I had so many people influencing me during that time saying well you like this you like doing this you you should do this you should do that. and I started doing it all and it was like man talk about being completely lost um, and I it you know kayaking fell in my lap and you know outdoor education fell in my lap yeah. and it was like this is cool I really enjoy this like I uh, you know I found, found. So I found my goal for my motivation. Okay. I, I guess you would say. Um, let's talk about what happens when we lose motivation. Mm -hmm. I want to add. I want to talk about David's comment real quick. He said. So I, he he says. So I feel like I'm motivated to be out there often to enjoy the river simply because it brings so much peace and happiness to my life. I think that's something that comes with time. You know, David, you've been paddling a long time, uh, from my understanding, and. You know, and I'm I'm right there with you. Like now, my motivation is just pure quiet, like more than yeah, anything I just else. Yeah, like that fun. Like expectationless yeah. paddling. I just want to go out, and sometimes I don't want to hear anything. I don't want to think about. It. Or maybe it's I do want to go out, and I want to think about things. But kayaking gives me that quiet space where I can just do that. And yes, it's just a, a joyful pursuit as opposed to going out and like that's where I'm at with Green Race yeah. right now. It's like. I don't necessarily want to go out and do it this year because the stress and the pressure that comes yeah. along with it. Not, most of my paddling this year, I just yeah. want it to be enjoyable. What you're getting at is that the beginner, the newer paddler, it's hard for them. It takes time for them to get to that point where they can just be cruising and having fun. Yeah. And then Reagan said, self-motivation will lead you to find goals that are sometimes unknown to yourself. Yeah. This, this brings up a great point, and this is something that kind of takes me back. And I'll post this up. You guys can dig through this stuff later. Um, in my background in school, when I worked uh, at the Adventure Center at Kent State University, um, was in team building primarily initially. So a lot of that interpersonal group dynamic stuff. If you ever wondered why there's a theme to a lot of the things that we do, it's probably because of my background there. But there's something that we call the Johari window, which um, essentially was you know how you viewed yourself, um, how others viewed you, areas that you know, you didn't know existed about yourself mm -hmm. and folks didn't know. And then there's also, you know, the area where you didn't know existed, but others knew about you. And essentially it's how all of those things kind of interplay with, you know, your personal motivations versus motivations being um, kind of influenced That's upon cool. you. Um, it's a pretty easy, the, you, if you go on, type in Johari, J-O-H-A-R-I, and you can try out Johari. I've never heard of this before. Johari exercises all the time. Um, and you can do it with your group, too, um, if, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, you know, but to me, like, it's one of those things, like, especially if I was going into expedition paddling or something like that, I would start looking at these kinds of models to have discussions to, to make sure that, you know, we have a common thread, you know, a common goal. I think that's really, really important. Yeah. Um, um, one thing, Taylor just made a comment, and then I want to go back cool. to the question that I asked you about what happens when we lose motivation. Um, Taylor commented about races um, are such great motiva motivators, um, and I think that what's tough, like what are the, you have green race, you know? Class 5 paddlers have green race or Russell Ford oh, there's or other Great stuff Falls. that I like doing too. Yeah, I know, but as a new paddler, having that like concrete event, so again, as a runner, like yeah, having a race on the calendar, like lights a fire under my butt. Like I'm out training and I have, you know, a uh, motivation to get through days that are tough because I have this end goal. And I think that that's tough for folks that aren't necessarily at a level that's catering to having a competition or an event. Um, that they can work towards mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's where 
sometimes, um, and by all means, I'm sure there's stuff out there as far as like races and events that I don't know about. Um, so if you guys know about them, let us know. But um, the Iceman race down in yeah, Columbia, yeah, South yeah, Carolina. no, that okay, that totally that's like forgot my about favorite that race yeah, ever. That's a great one too. It's, it's so fun. Yeah. Um, and really low stress, and I've swam there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I like that. I made a list of some things that we're gonna get to quickly. Um, but one of them is to find a goal or set a goal for yourself that requires commitment. Yeah. And so like signing up for a race, like, well, your baseline commitment is just showing up yeah. that and day, we, right? This is a big struggle that I think a lot of us have is paddling schools sometimes is like, what's next? Yeah. And this is something that clubs do really, really yeah. well. They have events. Right. So, you know, and we're, I mean, we're at a disadvantage in that we don't have the, the strength and numbers that a lot of clubs have, yeah. for example, but this is what clubs do really well. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you have a goal, you have that carrot on the end of the stick. You know, a lot of folks mm -hmm. take a paddling class and you don't necessarily have that, you know, that next thing, like what's yeah. next? Well, I guess I could spend more money on a class and not saying, not, not trying to discount taking classes, but you also got to get out there yeah. and paddle. Absolutely. Uh, like we're huge advocates of that. Like there, there's definitely times where I will tell folks like you are taking too much instruction. <laughs> Go paddle. Go do it. Go paddle. Yeah. Like, it's hard though, like finding new folks, like in, you know, those, yeah. are, those are scary parts. Too. All right. What happens really when nice. we lose our motivation? I'm a class two, three paddler. I've got my role. I've gone out. I've cut my teeth on some white water. I've started to get my butt kicked. Maybe the people I pad was paddling with, they moved away or I learned that they were jerks or <laughs> like, well, I don't know, whatever. Maybe I got injured. I lost my motivation. Well, I think that's why it's so important to have it at the beginning. Yeah. Like, you know, I didn't have it at the beginning. Right. Now what? So I got all my gear. So if you didn't have it in the first place, yeah. how do you find what you lost? Like, you didn't lose something that okay. wasn't already there. I've got all my gear. I took lessons. I bought a bunch of stuff. Now I'm not so sure anymore about why I'm doing this at all. And I don't know if I want to sell all my equipment that I spent all this money on. And you know, I spent all this time learning this thing, and now I don't even know. What do I do? Honestly, don't know <laughs> because I've never been there. Wow, um, you've never wanted to hang it up. Never. I sure have. I've never wanted to. Like, and maybe not um, a lot, but I th I can think of like one. There's listen. One there's time other things in like, life. Why am I doing this? There's other things in life that I've definitely felt that way. Like, but paddling. How is, do you reconnect? How do you reestablish the passion? So it's literally it's it's just that like it's defining what your passion is, yeah. defining your goal. It's so important to do it early on, like. Before you commit yourself to something, you really have to ask yourself the hard question of why am I doing this? Yeah. Like, and it's not like it's I'm, hard and it's uncomfortable. It's hard you and really that's know. life. That's yeah. life. It's hard and uncomfortable, and like you got to do that one. Um, but uh, you know, the thing is, is kayaking is definitely a personal choice as yeah. far as that goes. But you have to define it in that same exact way. If yeah. you don't, you're gonna you can get lost. Like you might find it along the way, but chances are. There's a lot of folks, there's a lot of case studies out there of folks that don't find it. Yeah. You know, they think it's going to be really cool and easy and all of these other things. Their perceptions were maybe realistic and it's not their fault. Like, you know, perceptions are, you know, created by so many different things. So if you've, if you've lost it, though, yeah. you have to define it. You have to go back to what it is that got you into it in the first place. And that's it. It's just like... When you're having a hiccup in your paddling, like you have to find the root cause of the problem. You can't just treat symptoms. You know that's the way. You know, again, a good doctor is going to get to the 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 root cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. They're not just going to treat symptoms, right. right? So, you know, sometimes like I'll just use the example. I always love using the role. People struggle with the role um, because it's like the most uncomfortable skill. But you get to a point where you can be comfortable with it. But maybe you 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 you've had a few knocks and now that role is suffering a little bit. So you have to go back to like what it is that's making you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to deal with that explicitly. Yeah. Likewise, if you feel like you're lost in it and you're kind of in a rift, you have to find what it was that got you there in the first place. Maybe it was a friendship. Maybe that friendship doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, uh, you know, it was a misperception. Is that a, did I, Misconception. Misconception. There, not, not misperception. Um, Who's misperception? I, I don't know who misperception is. <laughs> it's in your business. Um, I think it's a boat company. 
Uh, but yeah, I think Mr. that's Perception. I think that's what it is though. Like you have to really have a def definition of it. So, so I ask people when they first come, like for a beginner class. Question I always ask: Why are you here? Yeah. Like what motivated you to come here? Yeah. And then we have a discussion about it. Yeah. And it's always an interesting conversation and it's always an uncomfortable conversation. Not always, but there are times where it's kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, you get the people who say, well, I've got some friends that do it. Or you get somebody who goes, I'm having midlife crisis and I bought all this gear and now I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> you know, you've got that too, right? So, you know, and, but good and things not can come out of that. You all, know, out the, of all of those things, the, yes. The path there might not have been so what pure, I, no, but... No, and what I do you know, more so then is I really try to sell it, yeah. right? And I'm not just like trying to sell a ketchup flavored lollipop to a woman in white gloves. Yeah, try to repeat that one. But, you know, it's the idea. I'm trying to sell the highlights for sure. me. Like, like, what is it that I'm jazzed about? I remember folks telling me really early on, it doesn't happen anymore because I'm cold and dead inside, but... And I had people tell me early on when I was teaching that I always have this, per, you know, this just constant smile on my face and that when I'm paddling, especially when I'm out there paddling w uh, with yeah, my I'm own I'm sure no one has said anything like that to you in a while. I'm dead inside. Yeah. I'm dead. Um, you need to work on finding your passion again. Yeah, probably. This podcast is for you. This podcast is for me. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, let's reel so, it back in. Okay, so I want to talk about something because I asked you this question and you made a lot of really good points, but you didn't make any call to actions. So... <laughs> <laughs> it sounds, sounds like me. Yeah. So I went through this. I've been through this multiple times and I've done this multiple times, which was a writing exercise where I got to this point where I'm like, I got all this gear. Like, I've had awesome days on the river. I love my paddling friends. I love to travel. But right now, I'm like, screw kayaking. Like, I'm scared on the water. I don't even want to be on class one. Um, and I sat down and I wrote because for me, writing is cathartic. Sure, and um, it gets it out on paper exactly. and you can see it. So it's amazing I kind of worked sometimes. backwards. Um, I started with where I wanted to be. Um, you know, what was the top end? And like, it was, you know, oh, I just want to be able to have fun on the river. All right, well, what's standing in between where I want to be and where I am right now. And I was like really honest about it. Some of it was really embarrassing to write out. It was stuff that wasn't even like relevant to me. It was like worrying about what somebody else was doing, which as soon as I wrote it down, I was like, well, I can stop worrying about that because that's ridiculous. And that doesn't have any bearing on me in actuality. Um, but I wrote all this out. What am I afraid of? Okay, why am I afraid of that? Um, wrote all that stuff out. And then I started writing down, okay, what's my big end goal? I think I was still paddling at the Whitewater Center at the time. So I was like, I don't even know if I had paddled the comp channel at the time. And I was like, I want to paddle the comp channel and I want to be able to catch all the eddies mm -hmm. on the comp channel. Um, and so I made a plan, um, which left room for that expectationless paddle paddling, which I think is really important when you're trying to get back to a place of motivation to like still have fun and not feel like every moment on the water has to be one of like, I have to do this, this is my workout, you know? Um, but it was like every time I was on the water, I wanted to do so either something new or something that scared me. Um, and particularly at that time, that wasn't hard to do. <laughs> there was plenty of stuff that I could do at the center that was either new or scary. Um, so I had to do one thing each time. And then maybe there was like, you know, I wanted to be upside down 15 times when I was at the Whitewater so that, I mean, So it's different for everybody, but I think that's, you know, maybe that's not goal setting, but that was a plan. It For me, it was important to stay on the water. I loved it, mm -hmm. but I kind of forgot what that pathway was back to that. Um, and and writing things down. Um, yeah. So. Well, you know, and I'll use um, our, uh, our business as an example, like, because that's been, you know, I've been very motivated by it. Yeah. Um, I've had a lot of goals with it. Um, and that started back with kind of a personal mission. You know, this is almost 10 years ago now that I almost, I, you know, that I wrote it. And I haven't really rewrote something like that. Kind yeah. of just listing, like, things that, goals. You know, it was goal setting. Yeah. It was a goal setting exercise. Like, what is it that I wanted to accomplish in the next time? And you, you hear people say, one year goal is five. And granted, they always change, but having that written down, I could revisit it mm -hmm. and I could go, man, that was silly. And then you think back to like, where were you in, during that time yeah. and like how have things changed since then? How does that change perceptions? Yeah. I think that's all, you know, it's all a useful exercise. 
We're getting a lot of um, a lot of great comments yeah. right now. This has been a really good discussion, um, and you know some good ones as well. Um, you know the the friendships, the bonds that kind of form around it. I think is definitely one of the things, one of the best things about this sport. Yeah. Um, and you know I I've had close knit crews over the years, and you know we've gone separate ways at times. Um, you know that's 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 a tough one um, when you've had something like that and then you no longer have yeah. it. Um, you know, and then how do you get to that point where you you redefine it or like how do you not like try to superimpose that onto a new group? Right. Like realize that every group is an, an, an individual. Right. Um, you know, I I see some comments also about you know just the again the feeling of the elation of when you finally stick it. Um, you know, I think that's that's an important aspect too. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, if you overwork that that muscle, though, I, I'll say like that that adrenaline muscle, you know, that that part of the brain that really is releasing all those hormones and everything else like that, you know, you can you can get burnt out on it. Yeah. So it's understanding like that burnout can happen. Um, you know, there is there's a point. And if you're can constantly trying to perform at your top end mm -hmm. I think everybody has a threshold for that yeah. and a lot of the time you don't know that you've reached your threshold until you get get there you know when you're like on a river somewhere and you're like holy crap I can't do this yeah. <laughs> you know there's there's other times where you know we've seen folks have artificial pressure you know traveling across the world or something like that you know on a trip and it's like, oh yeah, you know, going across the country. And it's like I'm gonna I'm, run I'm it because here. I'm gonna run it because I came all this way. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's a yeah. really dangerous motivator. That's a slippery slope. Uh, so you know, those are those are the kinds of things that you need to look out for as well. And, yeah. You know, I there are times like, well, you know, there's there can be a negative side to all of us too. Like at times, you know, you can find people or groups that can actually kind of. Um, in a way, kind of prey on that. Uh, you'll you actually, mean? like, you actually get folks who start, like, they're insecure about themselves on the river, so they prey on those that are kind of insecure about themselves to help empower themselves. I've seen it in okay. rare instances, and this is, I'm just kind of bringing up some fringe stuff, things that I've seen, um, but you get, you know, kind of the predatory. Yeah. Um, this is how I feel. I want you to feel this way too. Yeah, and you should because of this. Yeah. Um, because I know more, I've done more, I've, yeah. here's my resume kind of thing. Yeah. Again, pretty rare, but it does happen. And I it's, think, yeah. It's I like to, talking about the positive side of things. Which and is, I do too. Yeah, I think the, that having that. But I'm a realist in that sense. Yeah, like sure. It does happen, and, you know, especially when we teach folks, we set them off. Yeah. That's the idea. Like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just like, I'm sure in some ways, like, you can you can draw parallels to raising children. You're scared to let them go, <laughs> right? So it's like, oh, my God. I've, I've given them enough to be dangerous to themselves. I hope they do all right. <laughs> you have to have faith in the fact that, you know, they're, they're smart human beings and that they're going to be able to handle it. And that, they're, that you're continually making yourself available, um, you know, to, to help continue the mentorship. Yeah. Um, but, um, man, this has been some great feedback, y'all. Yeah. And like always, you know, we can continue these discussions on and on ad nauseum. Ad nauseum. Um, we... Uh, we're going to continue these these podcasts, though. Um, I like it. Again, it's a stream of consciousness kind of style. Like, Lyd and I, I think, when we first sat down this evening, weren't quite sure how this was going to go. Yeah. She had a notepad of notes. I had nothing as usual. I have one. Um, I, have, you in, wanna, I have an in some, um, just because that's how my, mind, my mind useful. works a little bit. Um, and I made kind of a list of, you know, I'm sure that all of us at some point, maybe some of you now, um, maybe... You're all around feeling pretty happy with your paddling, but maybe there's like one thing that's kind of gnawing at you that you know you want to improve. Um, so I made a little list of things that I think can be helpful in maybe re-identifying um, our motivation and streamlining it towards productivity. Cool. Um, and the first, obviously, being the writing exercise that I talked about, which I think is you know that looks differently to, to everybody, but take some time to sit down with yourself and be really explicit about your goals and your motivations and how you're going to get there. The how is sometimes just as important, if not more so than the why. Um, and be honest with yourself and 
no, nobody needs to see that stuff. So you can write down embarrassing stuff, you know, things that you maybe wouldn't say out loud, but it feels good to write it down. Um, and that can help you create the goal. I love to talk about the races. Somebody brought up Alabama Cup, um, the Iceman. You know, we don't have to be all racing down the green or Great Falls to have some competition to, you know, add a little fuel of fire. And I like that. Um, find your tribe. Um, people that are like-minded, I think their diversity in a group is really good, but like-minded in the spirit and the virtue of the experience I think is helpful, especially when you're working towards a goal. People that are like, oh yeah, you're trying to work on stern squirts? Cool, I'll, I'll wrangle your boat for you if you, you know, when you get tired from rolling at the end of the day or whatever. Um, varying your paddling, so keeping things interesting and dynamic, diverse, um, not just drilling yourself every time you're out on the water still having fun. Maybe one day you're doing an attainment workout. Maybe the next day you're working with a new paddler um, and then you're actually pushing yourself to run a new rapid or whatever. Um, tracking yourself, both in terms of qualitative measurements and quantitative measurements. Um, I always start the year off with a paddling journal and I get tired and lazy and then forget <laughs> to keep track of it. But I've seen like, I've seen some of y'all with paddling logs that are just like amazing. You write down the level the weather, how many rolls you had, how many people were in the group. It's awesome. And I think to that's me, that's, really... that's, that's too much. But I think that's really cool. Like, yeah, that and, matters to And I'm a type A folks. personality, yeah. like, I through and through. Um, um, remembering fringe benefits to what we do. So um, health and wellness of your mind and body. You're building community and relationships. You're traveling. You're getting to see parts of the world that other people wouldn't get to see if you weren't paddling. Um, so there's fringe benefit benefits apart from just like having the cool roof rack, right, Chris? Yeah. I've got two of them. Um, giving back. So using your place in the paddling community to help others, teach service. new paddlers. Yeah, service, any kind of stewardship, environmental action or whatever. Um, something that involves you giving something back without an exchange. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, treat yourself, you know, you gotta have some rewards. Treat yourself. Yeah, you gotta have some rewards sometimes. So, like, I don't know, you know, buying that $600 RPM on gear swap, I don't know, maybe that's how you treat yourself. Um, but find a way to reward your hard work sometimes Shiny too. white, sweet rocker yeah, helmet. shiny black, sweet rocker helmet. <laughs> um, and then, um, I think that, that was, was not it. a paid had, advertisement. Yeah, I had something else here and I don't know why I wrote that. Um, so, anyway. Thanks for listening. She does a great job of summar summar summarizing everything up. I'm more of the, uh, I'm uh, the Jackson Pollock of the the thought yeah. world. Hey, Taylor Bohannon reminded us of Team River Runner, um, and that goes in well yeah. with our give back and our service part of Absolutely. how we can regain our motivation. Yeah. Thanks, Taylor. Well, cool, y'all. Thanks for joining us. As usual, we'll post this up on Facebook. This will live there permanently. We'll, you know, upload it to YouTube for those YouTube users out there, and we'll put up show notes. Uh, sometime this week, you know, in between all the other stuff that we have to do. So that if there was anything important, you can just read it and not listen to Chris and I fumble our way to it. We don't fumble. I mean, it's more entertaining than we're probably giving ourselves. I mean, we had a lot of comments, so that's always good. We're losing them. Yeah, we're losing them. Anyways, <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks for joining us. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube, like our channel on Facebook. And check out our website, h2odreams.com. Until yep. next time. And thank you to Saluda Outfitters for letting us host our flow state here in the shop. We'll see you guys maybe next week. Maybe. Maybe the You'll following know. week. <laughs> like, hit us with some ideas, though. We'll, we'll definitely, uh, we'll, we'll try to uh, appease to the, uh, the masses. Cool. So, did I use the word correctly mm, this time? We can talk about it off camera. All right. Peace, y'all. <laughs> Good night, y'all.